morning again. Our text this morning will be Ecclesiastes chapter 12, uh, verses 9 through 14. If you would go ahead and turn your Bible to that final passage from the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, I think one of the most critical aspects of any movie or TV show you watch is the ending. Um, Just this last week, my wife and I finally finished watching the show Parenthood uh, because she wanted to watch it. Um, But it ends well, okay? It gives you a very satisfying ending. You know, I think of some movies that I really like the way it ends. Uh, Movies like Ocean's Eleven, where at the very end of it, they finally put it all together and you see how they got away with it all and it's just great. Okay, or a movie like The Sixth Sense, where you watch it and you go, man, he was dead the whole time. Okay, if you haven't seen it, now you don't have to, right? Or even movies that end in a predictable way, like the original Star Wars trilogy, where it ends with the Empire being overthrown and the Rebellion wins. Even though you knew it was coming, it's still a great ending, because that's the way that story has to end. Okay, on the other hand, a bad ending can ruin a good movie. Uh, Several years ago, I watched the movie Sphere by Michael Crichton. Any of you seen that terrible movie? Yes, thank you. It's awful, okay? It's it's written by the same guy that did Jurassic Park. You're thinking, this is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. Okay, and then you watch the movie. It's good actors, good acting, well-directed. All this really crazy stuff's going on. I'm really into this movie. And then at the very end, it ends terribly. Okay, I'm not going to ruin it for you, but I don't need to ruin it for you because don't watch it. It's awful. All right, terrible ending makes a terrible movie. Uh, think about the most recent Indiana Jones movie that they made. Okay, they should have stopped at a trilogy, right? They didn't need to make that last one. It was terrible. The ending of it's terrible. Terrible ending makes a terrible movie. I tell you all of that because this morning, we finally reached the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. I know this has been something of an arduous sermon series, Uh, But finally, we get to the end of the text, we get to the conclusion of the matter, and I say all of this about movies and TV shows because I think this final paragraph that he gives us at the end of this long book gives us the entirety of what he's going for. Okay, notice starting in verse 9. He says, Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and sat in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard, Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Right, Ecclesiastes as a whole is not an easy book to get into. I understand that. I certainly appreciate all of you showing patience as we've gone through this sermon series. You know, some of this text is dark. Some of this text is confusing. It asks hard questions about death and suffering, and it doesn't answer all the questions that I wanted him to answer. Okay, I want him to give us more about why do bad things happen to good people? Why does the world work the way it should where the wicked so often prosper? But he doesn't answer all my questions. But we need to remember the ultimate purpose of this book, which is pretty easy to lose as we break this up into 20, 25 minute sermons. But remember the ultimate reason that the book of Ecclesiastes is in your Bible, the ultimate reason that he wrote Ecclesiastes is because he's asking the one question that we should be asking. How do we live a meaningful life? We do lots of different things in life. We chase lots of different goals. But the one question we should be asking, the one question this book answers is, how do we live a meaningful life? And the author of this book is the only one in a position to ask this question because at the beginning of the book, he tells us who he is. 
Okay, he's the king of Israel. He's wiser than anyone else. He had the power, he had the resources, the finances, the time, the ability in his brain to finally answer this question. If anyone was ever going to figure out the best way to live a satisfying life, it's the man who had everything at his disposal, who could chase every goal down to its conclusion, who could finally answer this question. How do we live a meaningful, fulfilling life? Throughout this book, he tries various options. He says you can pursue wealth and it won't give you meaning. You can chase pleasure or power or even wisdom itself and you can gain more possessions and pleasures and all kinds of knowledge. You can pursue all of those things to their ultimate end and still not find meaning. In other words, the things that the majority of us, the majority of humanity, spends their entire life searching for, striving for, sacrificing everything else, trying to achieve, we can even get all of those things and still not find meaning. The majority of people living in the world today will spend their entire life pursuing the wrong goals. So finally... After reading through chapter after chapter of this book, hearing how so many things that we do pursue in life are just meaningless, after he tells us that the majority of the stuff that we worry about today will not matter at all, and after reminding us, hey, everybody, you're terminal. You will one day return to dust. All of the stuff you've been chasing will return to dust. We are eager to hear a conclusion. How does this work out? What can we do as a people living for such a brief time on earth? How can we do something meaningful? How can I be a part of something meaningful? How can I, at the end of the day, have meaning in my life? He finally comes to the very last line. He says, here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. That's it. It's not about the job you work or the family you have, even the intelligence that you possess. The only thing Ecclesiastes says will give you a meaningful life is to fear God and keep His commandments. And the reason that so many people, that so many of us, don't have as meaningful a life as we would like to have is because at the end of the day, quite frankly, we don't want to do this. We like to think that our lives revolve around us. So we have goals like, I'm going to improve myself, or I'm going to pursue my dreams. But until we start putting God at the center, until we realize that I'm not God, but God is God, until I let my life revolve around Him, instead of trying to make my life revolve around me, I will always be disappointed and unsatisfied. To fear God and keep His commandments is really quite simple, but because of our fallen nature, it's not easy. And notice in this paragraph, notice how he sets up this final line. Notice verse 12. He says, Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. I remember once in graduate school, one of my classmates thought he was going to be clever. And so when the teacher gave us a big reading assignment, he quoted this verse back to the professor. He thought this might result in us getting a lessened reading load. It didn't. Okay, but here's the point of what Ecclesiastes is trying to say. He says there will always be more people with more stuff to say. There will always be another book that comes out. There's always another sermon to listen to. There's always another book on how to win friends and influence people. There's always another piece of advice on how to lose weight or how to manage your money, how to make your church grow, how to make your children mind without losing yours, right? how to have a purpose-driven life. I have an office full of books. I like reading books. You can learn a lot from reading books, but none of the things you can read in books will give you answers to life's deepest questions apart from fear God and keep His commandments. So verse 12 is saying that in contrast to the wise person who follows the Word of God and fears the Lord is the fool who has lots of words and keeps pursuing more and more wisdom out in the world, but has no real understanding. 
Again, what do we need to do? We need to fear God and keep his commandments. Uh, if, by the way, if you're taking notes this morning, if you write that one phrase down, I'm good. Okay? All right, here's the point we need to learn this morning. Okay, number one. Life is not about understanding. It's about obedience. This is hard for us to grasp. You know, there are a lot of things in life I don't understand. Uh, Rachel came home the other night after doing some counseling, and she asked me what the boys and I had done while she was gone. I said, one of the things that we did was I explained to my two sons everything I know about women. It was a short conversation, and now at six and two, they understand exactly as much as I do, right? There's a lot of things I don't understand in life. You know, I don't understand why Congress can have a 12% approval rating, and yet we'll send most of those people back year after year to Washington. I don't get it. You know, I don't understand how Dancing with the Stars is still a thing. I don't understand why anyone would prefer Pepsi to Coca-Cola. You can be wrong about that, and I can still love you, but I don't understand you. Okay? I also don't understand why my first grader has to take so many tests and has so much homework. Okay? He's six. All right? You know, there's also a lot of more serious things that I don't understand. I don't understand why good people have horrible things happen to them. I don't understand how to best address issues of world hunger and suffering and war and why I can turn on my television and see the news and see terrible things happening around the world. I don't understand that. I don't understand why so many people reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. I especially don't understand why it's so hard so often for Christians who are supposed to be brothers and sisters to have peaceful churches. There's a lot of things I don't understand. And part of our problem is we think that we're supposed to understand everything. And we live in a society in which we know so many things and we have access to tremendous sources of information and I can pull the phone out of my pocket and look up any fact that I want to look up and we feel like if we try hard enough, then we should be able to figure anything out. We spend our lives trying to increase our understanding, which in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing so long as we realize that there's limits to it. Okay, we try so hard to figure out the world around us, but at the end of the day, we need to realize we don't have to know all the stuff that we want to know. We don't have to make sense of everything that's going on around us, and it's okay because I'm not God. My responsibility is not to explain why everything happens the way it happens. It's not to try to make sense of all of life's persistent questions. Okay, life is not really about understanding everything. Your goal as a Christian can't be to understand everything. Our goal is obedience. So the book of Ecclesiastes as a whole says, yes, enjoy life, seize the moment, live for today and do what's good. But he says that the best way to enjoy life is in the simplicity of God's commands. We know that we will die. We know that we will face judgment. We know that we will have times of both joy and sadness in life. And in a world where we can't make sense of all of those different things, we can rejoice in the simplicity that we don't have to explain all of those things. I don't have to explain why my son is sick. I don't have to explain why you've lost loved ones. I don't have to explain all of the hurt that goes on in the world because that puts me in a place I was never supposed to be in. All we have to do is realize that God is in control and the only thing I'm responsible for is to fear God and keep his commandments. Does that work? Second thing this text teaches us is that obedience can be painful. Okay? Obedience can be painful. You know, like many of you, I was raised in church. Uh, I know that many of you here this morning came to faith later in life. Uh, in a lot of ways, I'm envious of people who came to faith later because usually when people come to faith later in life, they appreciate it more, right? They don't take it for granted, like those of us who were raised in church, and we think this is the only way to live. 
Okay, but if you were like me, if you were raised in church, then you were raised and taught that you were supposed to love God's Word. Okay, we desperately as a people want to do what the Bible says. Okay, I remember taking my Bible to Bible class as a little kid and getting gold stars on a board every time I brought my Bible, right? We wanted to teach our kids how important it was to love the Word of God. Our Bibles are the most reliable source of genuine authority for us as Christians. Okay, so as a young boy, I was learning the books of the Bible, the seven days of creation, all the stories of Jesus. Okay, and even as a child, I learned about why we believe most of the things that we believe in church. Okay, like many of you, as a child, I could tell you why we baptize for the remission of sins, why we take communion every week, why we believe in the gospel. By the time I was 13 or 14, I felt confident that I knew what it meant to live a Christian life. By the time I was about 13, I had read my entire Bible from cover to cover, because that's what I was supposed to do. Okay, and I went to church feeling pretty good that I was on the right path. Okay, but here's the problem with many Christians, sometimes myself included. Okay, we read our Bibles in such a way that all we're really doing is affirming what we already believe. I read familiar texts, I hear familiar teachers in my brain, and Scripture becomes something I nod along with and feel like, yes, we're right about all of these various things. And when we get to a point where we read Scripture simply to reaffirm who we already are, we are missing the point of what the Bible is supposed to do in our lives. Instead of letting God's Word challenge me and shape me and make me uncomfortable and transform me more into the image of Jesus Christ, I am tempted to read Scripture as a means of simply reaffirming what I already know. But I want you to notice again what our author says in verse 11. He says, The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Okay, the image here is not an image of comfort. You don't take these, these words from the wise and use them to make yourself feel more comfortable. The image here is of a nail. Okay, the image here is that when a shepherd was leading sheep or goats, he would use a long stick or a goad. A goad is a specific kind of stick you use when herding sheep. And on the end of that stick, there would be nails in the stick. And what happens is when the sheep start going their own way and following their own path instead of the path of the shepherd, the shepherd would take the stick and stick the sheep. It didn't hurt the sheep, but it made them feel pain, right? It made them feel uncomfortable so that they would get back to the path of the shepherd. Ecclesiastes says the words of the prophet are like these goads or nails given by God which keep us on the right path. Okay, this is a very different way of reading Scripture than the way I want to read it sometimes. Okay, suddenly, instead of reading Scripture to feel more comfortable about who I already am, I have to read Scripture in a way that hurts. So my point is, if we don't use Scripture as a way that makes us move from where we're comfortable, if we don't read Scripture in a way that challenges us to change who we are, become more Christ-like, then we're reading the Bible wrong. You think of the Pharisees in Jesus' day who knew Scripture better than anybody, and yet, instead of letting Scripture change their hearts, they use Scripture as a way to just make their own hearts hard about who they already were. We need to let the Word of God transform us. All right, final thought today, number three, is that God will bring every deed into judgment. Verse 14, he says, For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Part of what this text is saying is that someday all of us will stand before God. All of us will have to give an account of who we are and what we've done with this life. Have we lived in such a way that we feared God and kept His commandments? In some ways, this can be a scary thing, but in another way, this is a message of comfort. Okay, because we don't know how everything's going to work out. We don't know why the wicked so often seem to prosper, why the good people suffer. And yet, in the final line of this book, God is telling us, you don't have to worry about all that because at the end of time, God is going to make everything right. At the end of time, God will put the world under His judgment, and His judgment is perfect. 
And the great thing for us as Christians is that we don't have to be perfect because we serve a perfect Savior. Part of what it means for us to fear God and keep His commandments is that we follow Jesus Christ. And when we follow Jesus Christ, then on that day of judgment, we get to stand before our Father and say, Lord, I am not perfect, but I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. He is perfect. And we can stand before God with confidence. This time in our service this morning, we're going to sing a few verses of an invitation song. During the singing of this song, we as the church want to be here for you. Um, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. We would love to talk with you or pray with you about anything that's going on in your life. Uh, if you don't know the full gospel story, we would love the opportunity to share it with you. Um, during this song, if there's anything we can do for you, please come forward, talk to us now while we stand and while we sing.